Welcome to Novelist Spotlight. This is my console, your host. Before we begin this episode, I want to alert you that my latest book is now available in both print and ebook formats. The title is Love American Style, and it is a collection of short stories about men, women, their passions, and their dysfunctions. There's a short link in the episode notes that will take you to my Amazon profile page where all four of my books are listed. Three novels in this new short story collection. Again, the title of the new one is Love American Style, named after the TV series that ran from 1969 until 1974. Now, on with our program. In the spotlight, joining us from the city of brotherly love is C.J. Spataro. Uh, CJ, who also goes by the name Carla, is co-founder of the literary magazine Philadelphia Stories and director of the MFA writing program at Rosemont College, as well as director of the Master's in Publishing program at the college. Her short fiction has won numerous awards. Her short story, which she refers to as long short story, we'll we'll learn more about that, uh, titled The Twilight, won the Iron Horse Literary Review uh, Fiction Trifecta. Those of you who bet on horses know what a trifecta is. And if you're a baseball fan, think triple play. Uh, though she made her name in short fiction, she has released her debut novel, More Strange Than True, is the title. It hit the market this year and is on sale at bookstores and book selling sites. And uh, we'll talk about that in due time. Spataro came of age in Michigan but has lived in Philadelphia for more than 30 years, most of which has been with her partner, the artist and one-time stand-up comedian, Vincent Natali Martinez. CJ Spataro, welcome to Novelist Spotlight. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Mike. I really appreciate that. Does Vincent Natali Martinez still make you laugh? Oh, always. He's still a funny guy, even though he's, he's not doing, a- it sounds like he's not doing stand-up anymore, though. No, he hasn't done stand-up for a long time, but he... Uh, is a very funny person. So yes, in general, it's so his whole yeah thing. The comedy <laughs> remains, they, even yes. though he gave up the activity. Now you mentioned art. What does he produce in the way of art? Um, he's a, 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 a painter, visual artist. Uh, oil paintings, uh, yes. watercolor, oil, oil. What, what's mm-hmm. his subject matter? Um, he does both uh, landscape work and abstract work and sometimes adds abstract sort of representations of landscapes but uh still life's you know pretty typical stuff but he does he does do both uh semi-realistic work and abstract work gotcha gotcha Mm -hmm. so why short stories you're a short story writer predominantly i mean you did just come up with your first novel and we'll get to that but uh, you really started your writing life as a short story writer Uh, and and that has persisted i mean some people start off with short stories figuring let me just make sure i can get some fiction on the page Uh, but then they very quickly want to write a novel it seems that you even started a literary journal devoted Mm -hmm. to short stories so uh what why short stories um, I just really love the form. And I think um, the truth is uh, when you first start studying creative writing, uh, especially cre- fiction, um, short story is a much easier entry point than a novel uh, only because of its length, really. Um, it's not like short stories can't be complicated and take a very long time to write um but i think it's just it's it's easier form to teach and so it's also an easier form for students to you know enter enter into the conversation using short stories but i also personally just really love the the form always love short story writing and longer short stories Um, which are very difficult to publish, but, um, I do, I do really love, uh, writing a good, long, meaty short story. Um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of, kind of what it is. I just, one of the things I love about short stories as a reader is that, like, if you're reading a short story collection, you can read an entire piece, the beginning, the middle, and the end, like, in the hour or two hours before you go to bed. Um, 
instead of just reading a chapter or so of a novel and then falling asleep, which is normally what I do these days. Um, but <laughs> So uh, there's a sense of completion, both for the yeah. writer and the reader, really, because yeah. you have an idea and you can see that idea through to realization in a much shorter time frame than a novel. Uh, and for the reader, there's that sense of completion as well. I've, uh, and I'm not going to bed with the idea in mind that I wonder what the next chapter will bring. The story is complete and right. replete, hopefully, and they go to bed uh, feeling uh, fortified or uh, nourished in some way. Do you think yeah. that short stories today, a short story collection, I mean, they're harder to sell. Yeah. Definitely. If you're, if you're famous, uh, you know, if Stephen King wants to write a, collection of short stories, uh, which he has done, um, mm -hmm. I think numerous times now, uh, that's all fine and well because you have a built-in audience, but they seem to feel that short stories don't sell so well com uh, comparatively. But in this age, when you stop and think about short form reading is huge these days, simply because of social media, people have short attention spans. Uh, George um, Saunders with 10th mm -hmm. of December hit number one. I mean, that was a that must have been a pretty yeah. exciting uh, event for you as a short story writer, correct? Yeah, no, and I. It's funny because um, all you ever hear, like from agents and people in the publishing industry, is you know, all oh, short story collections don't sell, blah blah blah. Except for all the ones that you hear about that sell, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, <laughs> Except for the many exceptions. Yeah, and I feel like during COVID, um, short story collections were really having a kind of their. Uh, a moment. And I don't know if it was because of COVID. I think a lot of things in publishing, like, you know, mid-list and backlist books were selling a lot during COVID. Um, you know, I think um, people were, were just looking, like you said, and I think younger readers especially are used to being, you know, consuming smaller chunks of stuff. Although there are plenty of young readers out there that all sit down and read an 800 page epic fantasy novel. Um, right. Right. JK but, Rowling taught us all that uh, uh, yeah, children, sure. not yeah. only will children read, uh, you know, door stoppers, but, but adults, I mean, she wrote stories that adults wanted to read too. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's just, um, you know, uh, Saunders, I'm a huge fan of Saunders. Um, and, uh, I teach a class sometimes at Rosemont called uh, the seminar in the short story where we read collections of short stories. Um, and that way, what's kind of uh, fun about that class is that when you read a collection of short stories, you kind of get to see an author approach a bunch of different topics and, and kind of get to see the things that they do the same, like all the time. You get to kind of study their techniques and then you also get to uh, look at the ways they approach things differently, how different writers approach things differently uh, when you read, you know, collections a week after week. Um, and so when I have taught that class in the past, I've used Pastoralia, which was um, Saunders' first short story collection. Um, and there's been other writers, you know, like, um, oh, no, now my brain John Updike. Thinking. Yeah, I mean, I mean, a famous short story writer, but yeah, but, famous short story writers that have written basically, um, Ray Carver. Yeah, and the uh, there's a Canadian, um, uh, oh, Canadian, Alice Monroe, Alice, yeah, Monroe. Alice Monroe, right? Yeah, and also someone like Annie Prue, who's kind mm -hmm. of a you know, personal uh, hero of mine in that she got started very late in life, um, published her first book when she was in her late 50s, um. And then has gone on to, you know, publish novels and short stories. But I think she also, I've seen, there's this really great uh, documentary about her. And um, in it, she was complaining very much about having to write novels when all she really wanted to do was write short stories. So mm. um, she, she has to she, write the novels because that's what the publishing, the publishers want. That's what their, their, her agent wants and so on. Yeah. I mean, you know, she wrote the shipping news. That was her big her big mm -hmm. book made um, into a movie. Hey, where, made, where's this documentary though? Um, I can't even, is it on where I could, saw it? Was it on YouTube or so? I mean, is it a, that sort of thing? Yeah. Uh, it, I, I watched it on television. I, and I honestly don't remember when okay. uh, she, it was back when she was working on that old ACE in the hole. And that book might be 10 years old now. I don't know. Um, 
I'm sure uh, people can find it on uh, YouTube. I'll have yeah. to look it up. Yeah. Um, but go, go ahead. You were saying, yeah. I, I interrupted you. You were saying um, that she uh, uh, want all, all I really wanted to do was write short stories. And I kind of feel kind of pushed into writing novels. Yeah, I think she got very frustrated with the publishing process for that old ace in the hole. And she just was basically, I'm never writing another novel again. So, and I honestly don't think she has. I, I don't know. I'd have to look. Um, but I'm a big fan of her uh, work in general. She also famously wrote Brokeback Mountain, um, which is a long yes. short story. Yeah, it's, and a movie. A, and huge, a, movie, a big a hit very, movie. Very famous movie. And... um a really excellent short story. I mean, they changed, I mean, you know, they have to do that when they adapt things, but that's an example of like a 10,000 word short story, um, which now I think since the film, you can buy it published separately, but it was originally part of one of her collections. Well, and it wasn't it Larry McMurtry who read it and uh, he hates cowboy stories. He says, even though he writes about cowboys, hates cowboy right. stories, loved it. Well, it was his writing part who said, you read this. And I hate short, uh, uh, cowboy stories. Reads it, was completely uh, bowled over by it. And I think he, in his writing partner, I forget her name, but they they wrote the screenplay that yeah. won uh, best, uh, best Adapted, whatever they call it, Best Adapted yeah. uh, Screenplay. Yes. Um, yeah. So when uh, he got up there and said some... Um, things about you know writing and the book as a form and um when he accepted the award up there which was a great thing to hear yeah um, yeah i agree when you wrote your novel did you mm -hmm. treat it did you t uh, people we're always told when you take on a big project of any kind whether it's writing or 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 anything um break it down into discrete tasks did you look at the novel did you dope it all out and say i'm going to dope out um, X number of short stories that are going to be chapters and I'm going to treat it like short stories or, or was it, or did you treat no. it completely differently? Yeah, no, I absolutely didn't do that. Um, only because I kind of, uh, didn't conceive it that way. Um, in my mind when I, I, I originally thought it was going to be a short story. Um, I have, uh, was working, uh, I'm always working on more than one thing at a time and usually a longer project. And even though this is the first novel that's gotten published, it's not the first novel I've written. And um, and I'm always working on short stories. So How many uh, novels are sitting in wait? Oh, I don't. Yeah. Well, I've finished three, four. No, four. And four of them. I have, okay. Yeah, and I have half of one that I sort of – I I didn't really abandon, but I stopped working on it because I thought it was going to be like 600 pages long. And I wasn't sure I was really ready to take that on. Um, so is Strange your best one? Or do you think that you actually have one that's sitting and waiting to be discovered uh, that um, uh, is actually your best work? Oh, I don't know. That's I, I kind of I kind of can't. I don't know. That's I don't really think about it that way. Mm -hmm. they're different they're all very different this is the first one that's really had speculative elements in it um you know magic and fairies and all of that i had been working on this collection of speculative short stories and i had you know been thinking about my early days in philly and i had a rescue dog and um you know i remember being very lonely and uh, looking at my dog thinking, you know, why can't you be a person? Why, you know, <laughs> and that's sort of where the, the genesis of the idea came from. And then sort of just playing, uh, asking myself a series of, you know, what if questions? Okay. So what if someone wished their dog was a man and, you know, how would that work? Who would turn the dog into a man and how would all of that go down? So that, that was, and once I started like spooling it out from that original idea, I realized it was going to be a much bigger story than a short story. I, I knew it was going to be a novel. So I kind of waited until I had some time to really kind of dig in. I did do something different with this novel than I had done with previous books. 
Um, because I am 100% pantser in that, you know, there mm. are people who you, you like the, the spontaneous. Their, yeah. You, right by the seat of their pants, they just sit down and they get an idea and they sit down and start writing. And then there's planners. Those are the smart people that have outlines <laughs> and all this other stuff. I rarely, I, I, I do that on revision, but when I'm, I'm writing a first draft, I, I usually don't do that at all. Um, so you, you went fr front to back on this one, at least first draft, uh, by the seat of the pants. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I do with, with everything did it, pretty much. Did it, I mean, is that a, a, um, style or a methodology that you would still use going forward? Does it, does it produce the best content, which you then can, um, or the best clay that you can then mold into the finished product? Well, it's really interesting because I teach novel writing at Rosemont. And um, my feeling is that each book sort of creates its own process. And I know there are other writers out there that will agree with me that, you know, I remember after I had finally finished the first book, I, I sat down to write. And from the first word to the last word of the final revision was, uh, you know, 14 years uh, of work in which I wrote another novel and a whole short story collection and did an MFA. So it's not like I did nothing for 14 years, but work on this other book, but I did, you know, that's how long it took. And I thought, well, okay. So I got that one done, you know, the first draft of that and I, or second draft, third draft, whatever. I was like, okay, now I have an idea. I know how to, I know how to write a book because I've done it. And then I sat down to write the next one and it was a totally different experience. Mm. So um, I think it just kind of depends. One of the books that I've written um, that's sort of quote unquote in the drawer, um, I may go back and take a look at uh, again. And it's an, it's also an adaptation. It's an adaptation of the marriage of Figaro. Um, there are no, um, no magical elements in that book, but it is, it is very similar uh, in some ways to more strange than true and set in Philly. There's a central romance. It's a comedy. Um, so I might go back and take a look at that. I haven't looked at it in a while, um, but we'll see. I'm in, I'm currently shopping a, a new novel um, that is completely different from this. It does have magic elements. It's very science fiction. Um, but I tried to do the same process I did with More Strange Than True. Um, and what I did for, for More Strange is that in the course of my teaching novel writing, we, uh, the students frequently come in uh, wanting to talk about three-act structure. And um, so we do talk about it, even though I feel like it's not necessarily... Um, absolutely applicable to novel writing because well, novels what do you mean don't... by three? Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with that term. When you say is a three dimensional, or what does three X represent? No, the three X. It's something that's borrowed from screenplay writing. So, so much, um, and it doesn't even really apply to screenplay writing, to be honest, um, because there are no act breaks in a screenplay either. But it's just kind of basically a way to structure the book, right? So you have the first third, the middle third, and the last third of hmm. the book, and during each of these acts, quote unquote, these thirds of your piece, whatever it is you're working on, you're supposed to hit certain marks, right? There's certain things that um, should happen um, in order to fulfill that, you know, triangle, um, if you will, um, Bride Tog's triangle, drama and all that jazz. Mm -hmm. So um, the thing about three act structure is, and uh, like I said, there's no act breaks in um, um, in novels. There's no act breaks in in screenplays, even though, like I said, it's always almost always applied to screenplay writing. There's only act breaks in stage plays, and even now, there's very few stage plays that get performed with two act breaks. Right? It would maybe be one intermission in the middle, even Shakespeare, right? There's five acts um, and nobody does, hardly anyone ever performs Shakespeare with all four intermissions. Um, unless you're going to see 
there's a company here in Philadelphia called Quintess Quintessence Theater, and they always do um, at least one Shakespeare production every year with an all male cast. And they do it um, in that traditional way. They have four act breaks and during the intermissions, they have other performers come out and like sing and sell bottles of water and candy and stuff like you would have had during Shakespeare's time, which is pretty interesting. But I'm getting off the track. I apologize. Well, what um, is the title? Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say for More Strange Than True, I um, took one of these three act structure blueprints basically that I had uh, used in discussions with my classes. You know, it, it's always about like structure. How, how do I structure a novel? That, that's like the biggest challenge. I think a novelist, anybody who's writing something over 5,000 words has, you know, has a, um, you know, has yeah. to ask themselves, how, how am I going to structure this story? Like how, how is the structure going to affect the way the story is told and consumed by the reader? Um, so in this sense, I, I, I used each one of these. So it had sort of like 13 bullet points. Like the first one was, um, you know, the ground situation, which is just another way of saying exposition. Right. And then there's the inciting incident and then there's the rising action and there, you know, all these different things. So instead of having an outline, I kind of looked at all of these, you know, bullet points and use them as entry points into the book. So you'll see there's 13 chapters in the, in the novel. And so when I felt like I had accomplished, like in chapter one, the ground situation, uh, you know, I moved on to chapter two and that really, really worked for more strange than true. And the other thing that was really helpful in, in writing that book is that I also have a very clearly defined protagonist and a very clearly defined antagonist um, in the sense that the antagonist is working in opposition to the protagonist. Not that she's necessarily a villain because I don't see her as a villain, um, but she definitely is working in opposition to the protagonist. So that was really fun. I normally, you know, I'm writing a lot of literary fiction where all the conflict happens in the protagonist's head. Um, and that that's more challenging to make that interesting. So, um, but then when I sat down to write this new book that I'm um, working on or trying to sell, I tried to do the same thing and it just didn't work. Like it just didn't work at all. Mm. So I had what, to what is it. the working title of the new one? Can you say? Uh, yeah, sure. It's called Kaiju Island. Kaiju Island. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, let me back up a minute. I want to ask you about your award-winning short. I, well, there's several of them, but the Twilight yeah. in particular, I wanted you to tell us about that. And then we'll talk about uh, Strange. Okay. Um, and, then, and then this new one you're working on as well. So um, the Twilight is uh, a long short story you say how many words is it and what is it all about well i think it's at least ten thousand words um mm -hmm. so that's i don't know what is that 20 30 pages maybe more it's more than 20 pages for sure yeah um, more than 20 yeah but that's a lot of that's a lot of words so what 40, is 30 or 40 what is pages. the twilight so it and light is, is written for our listeners L I T E, right. um, but it's also uh, in the episode notes. Yeah, oh, thanks. Um, yeah, so that story was actually um, maybe my first stab at um, writing something speculative. Um, so it's the Twilight uh, is the name of a drive-in movie theater, and. So the story is about um, the main character. It's the story is set in the seventies, sort of during the decline of drive-in theaters. Um, and it set in uh, a fictitious town in North uh, West Ohio um, called Elysium. And it uh, is about a man whose father's recently died and he and his father um, lived in, uh, in the drive-in movie theater. Um, so 
I, I watched, again, like many things, I watched this documentary on drive-in movies one one time and gave me the idea for this story, um, that there were drive-in movie theaters that were built kind of like A-frames, and people actually lived in the movie screen. Um, so that's... <laughs> that's wild. I didn't know. I, I remember the A-frame. I didn't know people actually lived there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't either. Um, and it just so... So this this character he's very sad and he's very lonely and he meets a woman that he likes very much um but he's doesn't have the courage to like really ask her on a date um, um but then eventually he does but so what happens is while he's dreaming at night his dreams are being projected onto the abandoned screen of the drive-in movie theater and people in the town it's a very small town um are seeing this and so they gather um to watch basically his dreams as they play out on the movie screen and eventually one of the women in the town figures out what's going on and you know she goes to him and says listen i think you need to you know, you need to be aware this is happening before things get really racy. So, um, so that's, that's, uh, and, and I, the story is in first person plural. So it's uh, the narrator is a we voice. Um, and I was trying very hard to sort of capture, um, the nostalgia of the seventies and, you know, the, small town feeling and, and all of that, uh, in that particular story. Um, and there's a lot of secondary characters that I, I had a lot of fun with that don't really have a big, basically all they do is show up at the movie theater, but they all kind of have their own little backstory, which was super fun. Uh, it was really, uh, really fun story to write. So. Oh, and it was a hit with critics. Yeah. I, so it won the trifecta. And, um, which was really, um, was really gratifying, um, and published as an e-single so you can download it. And that was super exciting for me because at that point I hadn't, uh, published a book or anything. So it was like the closest thing I had to a actual book. Um, and the so graphics. So an e-single, is an e-single a PDF? Basically kind of a, an electronic, um, just a, a PDF or a kind of an e-book, a single e-book? Yes. Exactly. More ebook. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. And you, you can download it. It's on the uh, Iron Horse website. I think it's still there. It should be Iron Horse um, Literary Review. Yeah. They, yeah. they used, I think they've changed the trifecta. So, what they used to do every year, the reason they called it a trifecta is that they would publish one long short story, one long essay, and one long poem. And the winners, so there were three, that was the trifecta. And the winners, all, all the pieces were, published and formatted as e-singles um so i think now they've kind of changed the format of the contest but um yeah that was super fun um yeah so and that, yeah go mm -hmm. ahead i'm sorry i was just gonna say that let's switch over to uh mm -hmm. um strange your new novel mm -hmm. um what give, give us a thirty thousand foot overview on that one okay well, it's about a woman who is having a really terrible day. Like, um, it's been the, um, um, the book opens is the, um, a memorial for her father who's passed away. Um, I, I, it's kind of a coincidence that both these stories that we're talking about now have, uh, dead fathers in the background. My father's still very much alive. Um, and so they they've come back from the memorial and um the main character her name is Jewel her boyfriend um whom she's expecting to to meet at a restaurant with her best friend and her best friend's boyfriend um texts her and breaks up with her on the day of her father's memorial so she's kind of like all right I'm going to go home I'm going to spend some time with the one you know creature on the planet who really loves me and that's my dog and um, unbeknownst to her, her, um, friend's boyfriend, uh, Bobby 
who owns the restaurant, he packs her up this meal and she takes it home and goes to walk her dog. But she doesn't realize that Bobby is, um, has actually enchanted the food that she's um, going to eat. And so she gets a little bit sloppy drunk. She makes this wish that her dog could, you know, be a man. And um, she unwittingly uh, summons uh, the queen of the fairies. And um, after she falls asleep, the queen of the fairies and her two sisters show up and they turn her dog into a man. And the next morning she wakes up and her dog is gone and there's this man. And that's um, how the whole book gets started. And is this a man of her, of her um, dreams or is it a, a, a flawed man who she needs to kind of, uh, uh, work around a bit. Well, it's interesting because he he knows her intimately um, because he's been living with her, um, and he knows uh, all kinds of things about her. Um, <laughs> but he doesn't really know how to operate. Um, there's some scenes that I uh, I think are are fairly humorous in the especially in the beginning of the book where. Jewel basically has to, she has to teach him how to use the bathroom and she has to, you know, buy him clothes and convince him to put on shoes and things like that. Um, but part of the magic transformation is that he learns really quickly and very soon he, he really becomes fully human and operates in the world like a, like a real man. So he is very attractive, you know, I have to like. Takes him to parties, introduces him to people. It's all. Uh, oh, well, yeah. after he after he comes into his own, yes, um, interesting. So, uh, so mm -hmm. kind of ma uh, magical realism or fantasy. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that would qualify for magical realism or not, but uh, no, definitely fantasy. It, it's been called uh, romanticy by some people, which is kind of a new oh um, yeah topic, a new category that has kind of caught fire a little bit. And I was a little worried at first about it being labeled as a romance um, only because it doesn't have like a traditional romance ending. And I was afraid that people would be mad at me, you know, picking up thinking it's going to be a romance and, and then it has a different kind of ending. Um, but uh, I'm happy to have it uh, labeled as romanticy and I've kind of fully embraced that. So, yeah, um, yeah, that, that can only probably it. help. Yeah. yeah, people, it'll probably help. Mm -hmm. uh, so your new one, the one you're working on now, actually not even working yeah. on, you're trying to sell right now is, yeah. uh, uh, the title again is? Kaiju Island. And what is the story? Um, well, the story is um, about a woman who um, has these dreams about this crazy island um, that has these fantastical animals on it these creatures you know giant prehistoric looking creatures and anybody who's like a fan of godzilla is probably familiar with uh, the term kaiju it's a japanese word that just means monster oh, and okay. um but it's been applied to mean you know gigantic monsters and so it turns out you know it she also happens to have what they call the um her family's gift where she can communicate telepathically with animals. And so she decides she wants to become a veterinarian. The book starts off, um, well, the book, it's a nonlinear book. It's told through um, traditional narrative, footnotes, field notes, journal entries, lo lots of different things. Um, and it kind of spans uh, 1943 until the 1980s um but um the, this main character she eventually ends up leaving um this is in the late 1950s she ends up leaving that school because these dreams are compelling her to like go find this island and and, and figure out what's going on and eventually she um meets this man that she has also been dreaming about along with these animals. And he tells her that she's a caretaker and, you know, if she wants to come, he can take her to this Island where these animals are. And, um, she decides to go. So that's, hmm. uh, you know, and then 
the whole, the whole point is the caretakers on the island are there to make sure the animals never get off the island. Um, and then, of course, they do. So uh, eventually, and that that sort of is the, the big conflict in the book, um, getting them back on the island and um, some other stuff that's going on. So... Um, Are you getting any kind of reception on this one or is it, has it just been, uh, this one's not for me sort of that kind of the typical, uh, agent thing is, is well, this one's really not for me. I've um, had some, I, I've had some requests for full reads. I have, it's out with an agent right now. So, um, he was reading, I think, I think everybody else that, yeah, you know, getting an agent is, is really hard. Yeah. So I just, well, they're flooded. Um, they're just flooded mm -hmm. with. And I, I just wonder if, if uh, there aren't people who also change a title on something and they send it in again. So oh, because sure when I hear the numbers, I'm thinking those numbers are ridiculously high. There's, I mean, how are these people writing, um, turning out novels that quickly and in that volume? As many people as do want to write, uh, there are a lot of people who dream of writing books until they sit down to to write one. And then they realize, wow, this is not a simple task. This is- right takes a tremendous and exacting activity and you have to really be committed to it or really yeah. care about it. Uh, so Especially, the numbers are just crazy. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I always love going to parties and, you know, Oh, you're a writer. I always wanted to write a book. You should write my story. I'm like, no, I have no <laughs> I desire to write your story. Thanks. I heard that too. That if people think yeah. their lives are these incidents and their lives are so interesting. Um, but you know, uh, nobody could tell it like you can. <laughs> yeah. I'm just like, I'm like, well, I think you should write your own story <laughs> yeah, and right. let me know how it goes. It's, yeah, it's exactly. Not what you think it is. So <laughs> yeah, it's pretty funny. Um, so when you, when you're at that party and somebody mm -hmm. says, oh, you're a writer, uh, yeah. and they don't say, oh, I, you should write my story. Instead they say, I get that you're a fiction writer, but what's your subject matter? Is there um, do you, would your comeback be whatever inspires me at the time? Or is there a particular channel that you feel like you're locked into? Um, that's interesting. Cause I've spent like the last six, seven years really concentrating on speculative fiction. Um, and up until that point, I had written nothing but realistic literary fiction, um, except for the twilight, which was the one, my one sort of experiment in magic realism, um, at that early on and i i would tell people that i write mostly speculative fiction but most of my work centers on a female character um there's always a central relationship um in my work especially the novels um it could be a friendship it could be a romantic relationship um but that's that's Do you consider your, your writing character driven or story driven or about the, you know, magical settings? Mm -hmm. uh, is there, would you identify a, with, with a, a particular aspect that you, um, that you find yourself gravitating to, or really is the way kind of the, the conduit for delivering your story? Well, that's a, that's a really interesting question because I always think I'm writing something really commercial and like more strange than true. And then other people read it and they're like, oh no, this is literary fiction. I'm like, oh, okay. If you say <laughs> that's so. what, yeah, that's what it sounds like to me as well. But, yeah. uh, but, but then on the, on the other hand, you see, um, you know, movies that are, uh, well, to begin with, and I've said this before on the podcast, mm -hmm. just if you watch streaming channels like Netflix and so on, there's right. so many novels that are adopt, uh, adapted, which is tremendous. Right. I mean, there's so much more available to people who write books. And there's some pretty out there stuff sometimes, not mm -hmm. just on streaming channels, but even movies. You would think, why did they, what, what made them think to do this? Um, right. Yeah, it's been written. And yes, it was, you know, um, a hit maybe. Um, but there's more going on there than just, it's got a built-in audience. So I want to bring that audience to the theater because a lot of the stuff they're doing um those novels, the readership of those novels are are not the kind of numbers you need to pull necessarily for, uh, you know, the silver screen or for a streaming channel. Uh, but nonetheless, they feel like this is something that that can work. It, it'll work for me. And um, 
and you just you you just see a, um, a lot more of that going on these days which is which is to really a great thing yeah. Um, well, well, it's also, you know, I, one of the other classes I teach at Rosemont is an adaptation class, um, you know, literature into film. And it's just really interesting. Though. I'm very fascinated by adaptation in general. So uh, in More Strange Than True, there's a lot of Shakespeare. Um, there, uh, the Shakespeare is an actual character, like in flashbacks mm -hmm. and Goethe. And, you know, there's some historical um figures and you know for me it's just like you know I think every writer has like this stew pot of experience where you know at at, at certain points of their life like these are the accumulation of your knowledge and your experiences and these are the things that you draw from these are the things that inspire you and so for me um with my background in music and everything I frequently find myself um, leaning into that, uh, you know, musical influences um, and and that kind of thing, um, which I did actually even from a really young age. I remember being in high school and writing uh, what really could be called an ekphrastic e essay about Night on Bald Mountain. Um, so uh, just because I... I really love that piece of music and I wrote about it, how it made me feel. So, well, I was going to ask you about that yeah. because you got your bachelor's degree in music from central Michigan mm -hmm. and you got your master's degree in music from Michigan state. Yeah. Um, so you're a Spartan, not a Wolverine yes, uh, there in the probably. state you grew up in. Yes. yes. Um, so tell me about what were you, were you studying composition? Did you play an instrument? Uh and then I'm I'm curious about the move from what sounds to me like the move from music to writing. Uh, yeah. But talk about the music part of it. What uh, was a composition or do you play an instrument or two? No, I um, well, I went to college as an instrumental major. I played French horn and my dream was to be a professional French horn player in an orchestra somewhere. Um, but I also was a singer. I also sang. And so I was you know, the plan was to get a performance degree in uh, French horn and a minor in voice. And after my first semester at college, my voice teacher was telling me I should be a performance major in voice and stop playing the French horn. That's what basically what it came <laughs> down to. Um, so, and I realized that I didn't have the chops as a horn player to be a professional Um and I had zero desire to be a band director. So at Central Michigan, most of my friends who were instrumental majors, um, and actually most of my friends who were voice majors, um, ended up in education. So they were either choir directors or band directors. Um, I had zero desire to do that. I wanted to perform um, or not do it, basically. And... Um, I had a background in theater. My father is a ran a community college theater program for years and years and years. And so, you know, performing was kind of in my blood, even though it's not necessarily, it's not something that necessarily comes really naturally to me. Um, I learned how to fake it really good. And that has helped me a lot as a writer. So, <laughs> um, uh, but I always wrote too. Like I, I was, I was really torn. Like when I first went off to college, you know, should I um, major in journalism? Should I major in music? And I, I just kind of decided I was going to major in music and see how that went. And um, so that's how I ended up in Philadelphia. I was studying voice in New York city and I met a bunch of singers from Philly um, doing an opera up in the Berkshires they kind of convinced me to move to Philadelphia. I needed a place to live at the time. And so I moved to Philly, uh, you know, I was really young and I was like, yeah, okay, whatever. That sounds good. You guys are nice. Why not? <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and I've been here now for like, I don't know, 35 years. Um, but, so it agreed with you. It agreed yeah, with you. I want to hear more about Philly, but yeah. But I do want to first ask you, what do you yeah. see, what's the nexus between music and writing? Do you think in musical terms when you write at all? 
Do you see any connection between the two? Um, is there a relationship there that you have spent time making observations about? Because if you have, I'd like to hear what, what they are. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, that's a really good question. That's a really interesting question. I think um, for me, and probably not just me, probably other people as well, they find a lot of emotional comfort and support and information, uh, inspiration in music. Um, and so as a writer, that can be very inspiring. I've written a lot of uh, work that has been inspired by my relationship with music or my relationship with a particular song or a piece of music or something like that. So um, in a, in a sense, it is ekphrastic in that it's writing that's inspired by art. It's just usually when people talk about ekphrasis, they're talking about visual art. And in my case, it's music. So um yeah, and and from a practical standpoint, you know, having studied to be an opera singer for six years and then, you know, learning the literature on my own, you know, opera is full of like incredible stories and classical music in general, um, you know, unlike popular music where um, the, you know, song lyrics can seem like poetry, they're really in service to the music. A lot of classical songs are poems that were written as poems and exist as poems in the world. And then uh, a composer comes across a poem that inspires him or her and, or them, and they write, um, they write music and use, and use those words and to set, um, set to music. So, you know, is... you were, you wanted to perform and you were performing in music. Yes. Writing is a solitary act. You're in a room. Yes. And or a coffee house, and and presumably being left alone to sip your coffee and and write, um, was that was that a challenge for you at all to to move from what your aspiration was to be a performer, mm -hmm. um, which which meant you were going to be with other people and you were going to have an aud a live audience of some kind, and right. then boom, I'm a writer and I spend a lot of t time alone in a room, kind of like a a disc jockey at a radio station. Yeah, no, it wasn't a hard transition, honestly. Um, sometimes I think <laughs> you like that, sitting alone in a room with your dog. Right? <laughs> yeah, and honestly, like there are times now when I think back on my aspirations to be a professional opera singer, and I have so many friends who have done that, you know, who who are performers, and um, and I just think like, what was I thinking, like? trying to memorize three hours worth of music in a language I don't speak. And then to stand up <laughs> on a stage in front of people I don't know and perform it. Like, was I out of my mind? You know, I didn't realize um, it was opera singing that you, okay. Uh, when you were saying, yeah. you know, voice, uh, there's a lot of different ways to sing, but I didn't realize right. it was opera, highly emotional music. Yeah. Um, which is what you probably try to convey through your writing these days is, is mm -hmm. a, you know, you want uh, obviously it's very dramatic uh, 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 opera, and and you want to, you don't want everything to be you can't be drama on every uh, paragraph or page. Uh, otherwise, you'll just exhaust people. Right. Uh, well, in opera, is it's I have like I have written like one what what would could be called a, a grand chena, which is basically like a an operatic monologue. Um, with a composer, I wrote the text for that. And, and writing the text for an opera is very different than writing poem, you know, like writing an, uh, an operatic libretto is, is very different. Like you have to think about, you know, repetition. And when I was writing this, um, scene with this composer, I was even thinking about like, as far as word choices, like, Okay, because I was a singer and I had to perform a lot of contemporary music and a lot of times the composers have like zero sympathy or any knowledge of like how the human voice actually works. So it can be extremely difficult to um, sing some of this music. So I was just thinking, okay, so these are the lines of the text that are have the highest emotional impact, which means it's probably going to be in a higher register for the singer 
So I need to maybe find words that have open vowels so they won't have to modify the text so that the audience can actually understand what the person is singing. So I was actually thinking about things on that kind of a granular level. Mm. And um, I don't know that every librettist does that. I'm pretty sure they don't. Um, but it was a really interesting experience for me. It's something I really would love to do more of. Um, and I have been working off and on for a very long time on a full length opera libretto, which maybe I'll finish before I meet my maker, but, um, <laughs> we'll see. Um, but yeah, I so, think for, for me, uh -huh. the through, the through line with all of this is, I'm sorry, I get off on all these tangents, um, is, is, is the emotional, um, impact of all of this work, like of my, you know, my relationship with music, my relationship with writing, the relationships that I write about. Um, and, you know, when I, when I talk to students about, you know, this adage, writing what you know, which I think sometimes can be the worst advice you can give someone. Mm -hmm. I um, agree. I basically look at my students and say, you know, when I say something like that, I'm talking about your emotional truth. Like those are the things you need to stick to. That's the stuff that, you know, that can really inform your characters and their behavior and what they do on the page, you know, their occupation or whatever that that's just, that's just all window dressing, but it's, it's really that emotional core of the characters and how they react and respond to things. That's where you can write what, you know, I feel like, mm -hmm. so. you know, you were saying you've been in Philadelphia for more than 30 years now. Mm -hmm. what is it that you like or love about Philadelphia or do, do you feel like it's kind of a place you landed and you're just content there and wow, you know, 35 years go by in a lickety split. I love this city. Um, and I kind of fell in love with it from day one. I just, I had kind of moved around, um, after grad school, uh, for a short time, I lived in the South. I lived up in the, in new England for a while. And then, ended up in Philadelphia. And honestly, I was just like, okay, these are my people. Like, this is where I belong. So you like the mentality of the population. Oh, yeah. Okay. Sometimes is it a husband... Northeastern mentality? Or do you think it's a, it's, it's unique to Philadelphia? Oh, I think it's pretty unique to Philly. Um, Cause you guys although... boo at your sports teams as soon as they, they go, you know, you boo at your sport. It's a rough city. If you're in the sporting business, I don't know if it's rough also just as a citizen, just that people speak their minds and they, um, now I'm from the Northeast. So when I meet a person with a Northeastern, per what I call a Northeastern personality, I recognize it right away, very familiar to me. And I like it because it's very, it's very straightforward and it's energetic and so on. People tend to mm -hmm. speak faster. Um, I mean, I, I grew up in upstate New York, but you know, I've been out okay. West for almost, uh, my entire, you know, college and, uh, adult life. Um, but Philly, um, it's one, I mean, it's Independence Hall is where they wrote the, do I have this right? The uh, the uh, Constitution. Yeah, Declaration of Independence. Declaration uh, of Independence mm -hmm. and, and that. It's one of only a couple of places I've traveled to in my life where I really got chills. Uh, the history mm -hmm. of Philadelphia it used to be the nation's capital yep. before it was moved to Washington, D.C. But the Roman Coliseum and then being in uh, Independence <laughs> Hall is just like, wow, it's... Um, just knowing who was in there and, and yeah. the work they were doing and the, the way they had to hash things out. Uh, you really just feel the sense of wanting to go back in time and be there just as, just to observe uh, and be invisible and, and watch it all happen. Um, so you love Philadelphia. Uh, I, I really like the city myself. My wife, uh, it's her uh, pretty much her favorite city and she loves Bucks County, you know, new hope mm -hmm. and, uh, um, what am I forgetting there? Yardley, places like that. Um, is Philadelphia um, a big part of, I mean, is it the setting for a lot of your writing or not? No, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, it is the setting of More Strange Than True. And um, it is the setting of um, a previous novel um, that I wrote that was an adaptation of The Marriage of Figaro. Um and some of the stories, my, uh, cause I, I, right now I'm currently, I have a short story collection done and this new novel, the new novel is, does not take place in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Um, 
But, um, you know, my early work, I was very much inspired by the upper Midwest where I grew up. And so a lot of my stories were set in Michigan or they were set like in Canada or Northwest Ohio or places like that around the Great Lakes um, because I found um, I was very influenced by place in that regard. Um, yeah. The thing yeah. That's about, why I wondered about that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. The thing about Philadelphia is, first of all, I would say we're not rough sports fans. We're passionate <laughs> sports fans. <laughs> and I would say that is the, that is that is the word to describe the city you know people are passionate they're not afraid to express their opinions and they do it with emotion um so uh sometimes it can be really awesome and sometimes it can be really irritating so <laughs> um but most of the time it's it's pretty great and um i also really appreciate uh, which is something i found also in the midwest that people are pretty straightforward you know they don't they're not going to tell you something that they don't really mean because who's got time for that. So um, I do, I do sort of appreciate that sort of straightforwardness. Now, whether it's unique to Philadelphia, probably not. I don't think so. My hunch is it's kind of a working class uh, m mentality, kind of like probably Boston and Baltimore and, you know, but, you know, it's an underrated city, I think, uh, because people oh, yeah. will mention Boston, New York, you know, uh, Los Angeles, mm -hmm. Chicago, San Francisco. Philadelphia is usually not in the lineup of, of cities that people would rattle off. Uh, and yet it's it's a great city in its own right. Mm -hmm. And um, but it doesn't it just doesn't come up as often. Uh, you've got a lot of culture there. You've got a lot of sports teams. You've got probably a great. I, I haven't spent enough time in Philadelphia to say great restaurant scene, but I suspect it. Uh, I mean, you can even go to small towns these days and find good food. It's become such an art form. I'm sure Philadelphia's got a lot of great dining uh, great options. restaurant scene here. Yeah, definitely. And I spent a lot of time working in restaurants. Um, so in my time in Philly and my husband, um, until he retired um, this year, he was a bartender. That was his job his entire life. That's how we met. And uh, so he really was doing stand up comedy all along. It was just behind along. a bar. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so I, you know, Philly has a great restaurant scene um, and is underrated in lots of ways, which I kind of honestly don't mind. Right. It keeps uh, yeah. prices low and um, I'm happy to enjoy what the city has to offer. There are plenty of tourists that come to the city. Um you know, mostly in the summer, but, um, yeah, no, it's just, I, I, it's a, it's a very walkable city. It's easy to get around. It's deceptively big. Like it's a very big, I think city. geographically, yeah. Geographically square miles wise, it's, it's about the biggest in the country, I think. Yeah. That I don't know. I know population wise, I think we're number six now, um, used to be four, but like, you know, it's just, it, but they call it Philadelphia city of neighborhoods because, and that, and that's why it really feels like a small town. Like mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of, and I will say the thing, uh, another thing about Philly that gets overlooked is has a tremendous, a uh, writing scene here. Like there's just a, an incredible writing community and it's very different than the writing community you find in New York city. Um, this is what I have been told by friends of mine who live in, you know, who are writers who live in New York. So, um, it's just a completely different vibe. So. Interesting. Yeah. So you started, I said at the top, you started, uh, your co-founder of a literary magazine called Philadelphia mm -hmm. stories. Um, tell us why you got involved in the founding of that. And does it contain, uh, is that, is the, is the premise that you write stories about F Philadelphia or set in Philadelphia, if you want to, um, you know, fit the magazine's um, format? No, um, not entirely. So um, my partner, Christine Weiser, and I, uh, my partner in Philadelphia Stories, we met in a writer's group. We both love music. She's a rock musician, and I was a classical musician, but we had that in common, and we both loved writing. And, you know, I was, uh, this was back even before I went back to school and got my MFA, um, 
I was looking for places to send my work. And I ran across this magazine called Literal Latte, which was published in, in New York City, uh, where they distribute it at um, coffee shops and cafes and places in New York. So I just kind of off the cuff said to Christine, we were talking one day and I said, wow, we could, we could do something like that. What do you think? Like we could start our own literary magazine because we were sort of feeling... I mean, and part of it was the writers group that we were in. It was very insulated from the rest of the writing community. Um, but we sort of felt like there was all this really great writing and we knew all these really great writers and we wanted to um, be able to showcase it, to help showcase it. Um, and Christine had a background in trade publishing and um, actually B2B publishing. And I had a background in fundraising and so she said, yeah, let's do it. We can do this. So that that's how we started. That's how the magazine started. And the goal was to um, give uh, Philadelphia writers an opportunity to um, share their work. So the stories, um, the poetry, the essays don't have to be about Philadelphia. You just have to have some kind of Philadelphia connection. Like you either live in Philadelphia or you are originally from Philly. Actually, we, we expanded it early on because it was very difficult to define like what, well, what is Philadelphia? Like people living in South Jersey think of Philly it, like they're part of Philadelphia or people in Northern Delaware, some, you know, frequently. So we just set, we made it a regional publication. So you have to be from Pennsylvania, New Jersey, or Delaware either originally from or currently living in one of those three states um, in order to be eligible to be published. Now, the magazine does run a poetry contest and a fiction contest, and those are open nationwide, um, but everything else is regional. And, you know, that's that's why we we started doing it. And we did it for 18 years, and then after 18 years, we turned it over to two other really capable, awesome women who are now running it. And um, I sit on the board of directors. So I kind of keep my, I'm around if they need questions answered and all that kind of stuff, but they're really running the show now, um, which is great, which is what we really wanted. We wanted to start something that would last beyond the two of us. Yeah. And yeah. And it's happening. It. So, yeah. Well, yeah. good, good deal. Good deal. Well, CJ, um, thank you for taking the time and coming on the program. I want to wish you luck with uh, more strange than true, and and your uh, the novel that you're shopping around right now. Uh, again, to our listeners, more strange than true is available now for purchase. And um, uh, but but um, CJ has also got another novel that she was talking, uh, kind of briefed us on, mm -hmm. that is out there um, uh, making the rounds, looking for some, uh, looking for a home looking for a yeah. publisher. So I wish you luck with that, CJ. Um, uh, very interesting discussion. Uh, you've done a lot of things. We, you've done a lot of things I haven't even told people about that, uh, that you, you, you've done. Um, you've lived an interesting life. Oh. So um, again, thank you for coming on the program. Well, thank you so much for having me, Micah. This has been a really wonderful conversation. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you.